This might look like a boring office, but here is where the magic happens, the post-production. You guys have seen us on many different shoots, filming music videos, commercials and fictional projects. But what happens after that? How do we organize our material and edit videos as a team? What kind of computers, softwares and gear do we use? And how do we deal with the clients in post-production? This topic is quite overwhelming in just one video. So bring your coffee or tea and join us as the people here at Views share their best advice in post-production. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah. har du klart first utkast? Kunden kommer om 10 minutter. Om 10 minutter? Ja. Yeah. Ok, jeg skal fikse det. Takk. Even though we run a production company with eight employees, the steps we're going to talk about can relate to solo filmmakers as well. Hope you enjoy. The first thing we do after a shoot is to back up everything. We have two different servers. Uh, one of them, which is the main one that we work off of. This is the QNAP TS1635AX, and it has eight 18 terabyte drives, which gives us in a RAID a total capacity of almost 150 terabytes. Uh, in addition, it has four terabytes of SSD cache, so it's really fast. This is connected to our switch with a 10 gig cable. Additionally, we have another uh, backup server, which uh, takes backup off of the main server every single night. In addition to this, we take backup off to cold hard drives um, every so often, so that we have several copies. We have the same kind of folder structure on every project where we put it in the footage we shot, the stills, if we have some BTS for YouTube, uh, we have that in our folder. And also when we start a project, we create folders for things like music, templates, graphics, exports, and things like that. Of course, uh, on bigger international projects, which we do sometimes work on, for example, for Netflix, they have very strict uh, rules for how you're gonna offload your footage by using programs such as Shotbot Pro. And of course, for big projects, that is really good to have these kind of uh, stricter uh, regulations how you offload but for our usually smaller projects uh, we've been fine by just doing it the old manual way now for six years and hundred different projects the server is connected to the rest of the office here we have eight different computers in addition to a Mac in the editing room each of them have their own dedicated 10 gig connection If you've been working with a client, you probably experienced that they want to do new edits, they want to do new changes to your edit because they get so excited to see what you have edited. Make sure beforehand that you have made an agreement, a written agreement on how many revision rounds you're going to have. And also what you're going to deliver. Is it uh, different formats? What's the length approximately? Do they need subtitles? All of this, because time is money. And if you are using a lot of time on every project because you need to add things you haven't agreed, you're gonna lose money. You really don't want the client to come to you when you're, you think you're done and they're like, but well, where's the social media video? Where's the short version of it? Where's the subtitles? And you're like, hey, we didn't agree that. <laughs> make sure you agreed on this because it's gonna make a lot of uh, chaos in, in the post-production if you haven't agreed on that. Also, it helps when you give the um, client a budget if you know exactly what they want delivered. So that's a good idea to think about. We could talk forever about the editing process. We are making a dedicated video all about editing that you've been asking for a lot. But for now, we're just gonna keep it to our most important and practical advice when it comes to editing and how that affects our workflow. Since we are running a production company, that means that we are often multiple people working on the same project. One person might be doing the ref editing while another is finishing up the video. Someone might work on the grade while another is working on the sound. And then some might working on the VFX or the graphics. So this means that you have to be really mindful of the people you're working with. We've used DaVinci Resolve as our editing software for over a year now. One of the reasons we love Resolve so much is the Blackmagic Cloud. This has really changed our workflow. The way it works is kind of like a server. Multiple people can work on the same project and it updates in real time. And you also have extra security if something were to go wrong.
When you're editing, and especially as a team, it's important to have an organized project. So this is generally how we like to do it. The project I'm using as an example here is actually a mini documentary that we made about our switch over to DaVinci Resolve. The video is out now on our channel if you want to have a look. So if you want an update uh, on that, this is it. We have now used it for over a year and uh, things are going a lot better. And no, we are not sponsored by Resolve. So here are all of our folders. Of course, we have the folder for the raw footage. And here I like to always separate the different cameras, the different location, the different days. Then of course we have the timelines. As you can see, there are a lot of them. Then of course you'll have folders for everything else like music, graphics, VFX, sound design, or any other elements that you want to use in your edit. When you work as a team, someone might want to go back and look at the footage or they might get ideas that you hadn't thought of. From the start, I like to have all my raw footage in one timeline where I do my selects so it's easy to go back. And I always duplicate the timeline when I'm making a new draft. Probably my best tip that really affects our workflow is how I do my selects. I love color coding my selects. It just makes my life and I think everyone else's life easier. So as you can see, that is what I've done in this project. All of the speaking clips are in this orange color. Then we have the pink for B-roll. And then I'll also have a third color for the shots that I think are just so good. They have to be included. Like I want to f***ing zoom in the cut page. So when I go through their interviews and I'm picking out the best clips, I will give each of them their own color. If we're making a video about a specific lamp, I will probably color code those clips showing that lamp really well in a specific color. Later when I'm editing and I'm like, oh, I need some B-roll of, of this lamp because we're talking about it, then it's so much easier for me to find. I also sometimes like to take my selects to the track above to make it easier to just copy and paste into another timeline or makes it very easy to see what it is that I like. As you can see here, the timeline ended up really quite uh, colorful and beautiful. And I just think that this is a much easier and more visual way of seeing what your edit looks like. You can see if you have a lot of b-roll or maybe you're missing a lot of b-roll. And also, last but not least, when you're working as a team, I think this is a much more efficient way of working because you might be the one doing the select, but then another person is coming in and continuing the edit. And if every clip is just the same color, they will have to actively go through and watch much more in order to decide what they need. And especially if you're sitting with the client, getting feedback in real time, it's just gonna be so much easier for you. And you can find the clip you're looking for so much faster and it's gonna make you look a lot better. Using shortcuts is essential to be an efficient editor. We got to test out Torbox to optimize our workflow and Torbox is fully customizable. We've mentioned previously that we tested out the speed editor from Blackmagic, but it wasn't really for us. One of the reasons is because it's not fully customizable. The shortcuts like UWE didn't exist. With the Torbox, however, you can choose exactly what shortcuts you want. There are only 14 buttons on it, but with your own combinations, you can have a total of 40 different commands. So here are some of the shortcuts we have set up for our Torbox. This one is play and stop. This wheel is to zoom in and out in the timeline. This one is to move forward or backward in the timeline one frame at a time. This one is to speed up the video. This is save. This one on the side is undo. Then these four are Q, W, E. And ripple delete. Then we use this one to select all the clips starting from the playhead. This one is trim mode. This is delete gaps, and this one is delete. Then you can do whatever combinations you want and double clicks. So I'm gonna give you a few examples. If I double click on this one, it's enable clip. This combination is copy, and this one is paste. All of this being said, we have experienced some weird bugs, some commands not working as they should or just stop working altogether. So we are hoping that they're working on it and that it's something they will fix in the near future. Unfortunately, Blackmagic doesn't have an open API for DaVinci Resolve. So although the Torbox works really well in the edit page, it doesn't really work the same in the color page as the Blackmagic color panel does. Adobe, however, does have an open API, so it does work even better with Premiere, Photoshop, After Effects, and so on. 
Music and stock footage is something we often use. We have a subscription to both Artlist and Epidemic Sound, and we use it for both our commercial work and YouTube videos, and we also use them for sound effects. Depending on the project and budget, you might want to use stock footage to enhance your videos, and when we do, we get ours from Artgrid. We recently tried to make a commercial using only stock footage, music, and sound effects, so if you want to see how that went, you can go check out the video. When it's time to do the VFX, we start by locating the clips that require VFX inside the Vinci result. This process can be easily done by color coding the shots that require VFX when you're putting the edit together. Depending on whether the edit is completely locked or there could be possible changes, we might choose to add handles on each side of every clip around 10 to 20 frames. When this is done, we export the VFX footage as separate clips in Apple ProRes 4444 with the log color profile from the camera. Then we do our VFX inside of After Effects, making sure to add a temporary CST as an adjustment layer so that we can work in Rec. 709. That way, all the adjustments and color matching we do inside of After Effects will fit with the log footage when we turn off the CST and export it back into DaVinci Result for color grading. I personally haven't used Fusion that much, but I know that some people at the office have, and we've come to the conclusion that as of right now, we're still gonna opt for After Effects when it comes to more advanced VFX. So these are all of our most important tips about our editing workflow, and now it's time to send over the first draft. When we are sending our first draft here at the office, we use Dropbox. It's very convenient because you can just quickly upload it to Dropbox and send a link to the client. Uh, remember to give the file name a good name so it looks professional, maybe the project name with draft one or something like that. What we usually do as well uh, is to burn in a time code into the edit from the editing software. Uh, what's uh, good about this is that, uh, first of all, they will get reminded it's just a draft. So what we're asking for is just a feedback for the skeleton, the, the story. Another good thing about adding the time code in the video is that uh, they can then use that to give feedback so they know exactly in which seconds uh, they want to give feedback on and they can mention that in the email when they answer back. And if you're sending uh, several files, uh, it could be a nice idea to have uh, folders. So maybe the widescreen videos are in one folder, the vertical videos are in one folder, so it's organized and professional. Uh, the clients always like that. Then comes the scary part, the feedback from the client. There are different ways to do this, uh, and uh, I would recommend you guys, if you are sitting with someone, show them the draft before you send it, to make sure it's it's uh, not too crazy, <laughs> it's not too far off. In Dropbox, you can also comment uh, on time codes uh, and give feedback uh, through Dropbox. There's also something called Frame.io, which uh, we have used sometimes to get feedback from the client. When the edit is locked, we do two processes at the same time. It's sound design and color grading. Both of these are very big topics, so again, we're not going too deep into it in this video, but basically for sound design, if it's an uh, easier, smaller video, Marius, our sound designer, will do the mix inside of Fairlight. If it's a bigger project, we will export out an AAF, which uh, he will use in his uh, other program, which is Nuendo, which is his program of choice. Um, so that's where he will do bigger projects. When it comes to grading, I try to simplify the timeline by putting everything on one track or at least as few tracks as possible. That way it's a lot easier to keep track of uh, all the different clips and it simplifies the process. Generally, we add a color space transform node and get the footage into the right color space from the original log space. And this gives, of course, a nice starting ground to start grading. Before the color space transform, we will add some noise reduction if that's needed and also some nodes to balance out the image in terms of color and uh, exposure. Uh, and then we add some nodes after to give uh, a nice look to the image. For example, we often use the built-in film emulation stocks in DaVinci Resolve. And our favorite way of grading our footage is to use a plugin called Filmbox. This is a quite expensive tool, but it's uh, by far the best film emulation uh, software that we have found. Uh, it gives a really nice look to the image. It has nice grain and halation. And this is sort of our go-to on a lot of our projects. Of course, if we have some project that doesn't require such a stylized look, we'll go for more of a cleaner Rec. 709 
image. So finally, at the end of the note tree, we add one last note that can correct uh, anything that needs to be fixed after the look has been applied. So for example, to adjust the black levels after the film emulation has uh, been added. Um, any sort of shift in the image that you want to do, we do in that last note. Now that we are ready to export, here are the settings that we use for our deliveries. We use QuickTime for better audio export, and we usually deliver everything in 4K unless anything else is specified. We set the automatic quality to best, and if we have subtitles, we will either burn them in or export a separate SRT file. Unless the project requires otherwise, we usually export everything in H.264. The reason is that this can be played on all media players. So although H.265 will give you slightly better quality, not all of our clients are able to play this on their end. And lastly, for sound, we use linear PCM codec and 24-bit. In addition to videos, it's also important for us to document our shoots with still photos that we can put on our website and social media. For this, we have set up a centralized Lightroom library uh, that's synced across Dropbox so we can use it on all the different computers. It's not an ideal solution, but it works okay for now as long as we are just using it one at a time. Inside this library, we have all the different projects in different folders, as well as we created a collection for each of the members of our team. So it's easy to find photos of the different people here. Of course, we also use uh, Photoshop to fix some of our photos and it works really nicely together with Lightroom. And lately, we've started using the Tor box for editing photos inside of Lightroom as well to get a more hands-on experience and it's working really well. So the last step of our workflow process is creating content for our own Instagram. This past year, we've been a lot better at taking stills while we're on set. And this way we have really high quality photos that we can use both on our website and on our social media. So we edit all of our photos in Lightroom. I then take the best of the best. I put them into Photoshop to put on our borders that we use on all of our Instagram and social media photos. I put on our icons and some text and then they are ready to be published. We also, of course, post videos and reels on our social media and for these I try to keep them around 20 seconds no more than a minute and I really try to choose the best of the best shots so make sure to follow views on Instagram to keep up with the latest projects we are working on Whew, that was a lot of information on how we do our workflow from start to finish a lot of things have changed the past years so we always try to adapt with the new software new gear to be as efficient as possible with our workflow. So I don't know, maybe in a year or two, this video will be totally different. But we hope you learned something new and uh, subscribe for our next video, which is gonna be about editing, which is also a big topic, so it's gonna be interesting. And also we have videos coming later, which is about building a sci-fi street in our studio. So you have to subscribe and stay tuned on this. It's gonna be awesome. Uh, if you wanna check out our film course, go into, uh, into annex.com and send us an email. This, it's uh, this June and we have five spots available uh, at this moment. So check it out and we'll see you again next week. Hallo